What I wanted to address today is the subject of the two special Krios that we've had in the last two Shabbosos. You know, we had the Kriya uh, eight days ago of Parshish Paraduma, Chukas, Zos Chukas HaTorah. And yesterday we had the Kriya of Zos Chukas HaPesach for the Shabbat before Rosh Chodesh Nisan. And I was thinking of perhaps comparing and contrasting them. I don't think it's coincidental that one follows on the heels of the other. And not only that, they both begin with the same word, chukah. In the case of Paraduma, it says, Zof chukas haTorah. And in the case of the Karvim Pesach, Zof chukas haPesach. Both cases start with the word chukah. How would you translate the word chok? <laughs> ordinance. And how is it different than mishpat, which is also a law or an ordinance? Reason. Correct. In the case of chukim, <laughs> of a chok, we really don't understand the reason behind it. We believe that Hashem, the divine being, generated this command, this decree, this ordinance. There must be a reason behind it. But it defies human comprehension. We may give an attempt to try to understand the symbolism of the mitzvah, but it's a chok. In the case of mishpat, on the other hand, this is something that's logical, perhaps a moral law, something that society can appreciate, can understand. I'll give you an example. Where would you classify the mitzvah of kibud avaim? Is respect for one's parents a mitzvah that you would call a chok? that totally defies human comprehension, or is it a mishpah? Something that makes Friends logical sense. Depends if you're a child or an adult. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on which side of the table you are. You're a parent or a child. Uh, it's very fascinating that the, um, the Orach HaShulchan, who was one of the great posts came about a century ago, writes that um, the reason we don't make a bracha on Kibbut Avem, if my father asks me for a cup of tea, I don't recite a bracha, Sher Kitshon Mitzvah Vitzivanu, is because it's a logical mitzvah, it's a mishpat. You can't say, Asher Kitshan of the mitzvot of God, you have commanded me, and that's why I'm fulfilled. Even had I not been commanded, I would certainly be motivated for Kibbut Avem. In fact, the mitzvah of Kibbut Avem <coughs> is universal. It's accepted by all men and all people at all times. And yet, the, the situation is not clear at all. The Ramam says that if you have an elderly parent who takes away something from you publicly or takes a shoe and throws it at you and spits in front of you even if you're sitting with the governors of the country, yishtok, you're not allowed to say a word. You can't even indicate according to the Ramam some sort of pain that you're suffering from, psychological anguish. And then the Ramam concludes by saying al melech but rather he should accept the divine decree who commanded him to respect his parents. Imagine in that situation, is it logical? So we have this case which is a mishpat and yet it's a chok. And the lines that divide the two become somewhat unclear. So the Torah very often speaks about chukim u mishpatim but doesn't always give us a clear answer to the question of how to classify this mitzvah, that mitzvah, is it a chok, is it a mishpat, what is it? And therefore, when we get to the case of the chok of Paraduma, or for that matter, the chok of the carbon Pesach, we're wondering what makes this a chok? What is it about the Paraduma, the, the carbon Pesach, that defies our understanding? Now, what I have in front of you, which I'd like you to take a look at, is a Rashi at the very beginning of Parshish Mishpatim. Rashi says, V'ela ha-mishpatim asher tasim lifneim. And Rashi is bothered by the word, by the letter Vav, V'ela mishpatim. And he says, Mosif ala rishonim. Ma rishonim misinai af elu misinai. The mishpatim are meant to be statutes that govern legal, social interactions, and therefore makes sense, they're mishpatim. But they, the, the vav at the beginning of Vela mishpatim links us back to all the ordinances that were given in Parshas Yisro that may or may not be logical. They may come under the classification of a chok. So there was a Hasidish Rebbe in Ger called the Chidush Arim, 
And he says that what Rashi is trying to convey to us, the Elam Mishpatim, to connect the Mishpatim back to what came before, all the ordinances and the Chukim, is to say that just like the Chukim we accept, because it's a divine decree, and we are committed and dedicated to the Chok, that's exactly our attitude towards a Mishpat. Don't accept a mishpat, a, uh, a logical statute in society because you think it makes sense to you, but rather, just like the Rishonim, the original set of mitzvot that were given at Har Sinai may or may not be logical, their demands may be extreme and pressing, so too, in the case of mishpatim, your attitude should be, I am dedicated to fulfill the will of God. This is a mitzvah like any other mitzvah. So at the end of the day, even if we say that Mishpatim are logical and it makes sense to our minds, and even if we say that a chok doesn't really make sense to us, we fulfill both with the same level of commitment. Absolutely dedicated to the strict observance of the law. Clear? Now my Rebbe Rav Soloveitchik, the Colonel of Racha, used to try to illustrate that what we call Mishpatim and we call logical statutes are not necessarily so. If you turn to page 2, and if there are any typos, it's my fault, because it took me a while to type this in. Rav Soloveitchik, in a lecture that he gave many years ago, speaks about the fact that we have to surrender our minds to God, even with regard to Mishpatim, the so-called logical mitzvot. And he says that he's going to give us a number of examples of what we would certainly classify as Mishpatim, as logical, and yet, when you stretch it a little bit to its extreme, it becomes very unclear. And therefore, we have to give our entire selves as a commitment even to the Mishpat. Take, for example, the case of murder. Certainly something that we abhor, something that every legal system on the face of the earth should, should certainly ju adjudicate. And yet, there's a whole slew of cases which are unclear. He gives the example of Dostoevsky's famous literary work, the masterpiece called Crime and Punishment, about the murder of an elderly, elderly woman who was not only a drain to society, but she was oppressing a younger girl. And her loss was nothing to the world. The entire book is written about the sense of guilt for the murder of this woman. She was terminally ill, and so forth and so on. What about euthanasia? <clears throat> Again, we're getting into that gray area. We're talking about relieving a person of his or her pain and putting them to death. You know, kind of suicide situation, but justified morally. Again, justified I use in, in quotation marks. Or take, for example, the case of, a, uh, of an embryo. Is an embryo considered a live being? <clears throat> Would one be culpable for murder if they terminated the life of an embryo? When is a person considered alive? Is it when they begin to speak? Does a mother have a right to say she wants to be a mother, she doesn't want to be a mother? Can she put the, the fetus to death? And what about a little baby before the baby's capable of speaking? Where do you draw the lines? What about stealing and corruption? There are so many situations in which we justify what we do. And then the gray areas in, in modern society of of homosexuality, adultery, all sorts of promiscuity, and so forth and so on. Perversion? Yes. The, <clears throat> sorry to interrupt. But no, please. In the case of the murder, that we hold the Yerushalayim murder, this is a question of how you define murder. It's not a question of whether you should murder or not. Correct. But right. the point is that even yeah. if you accept so. murder as being something abhorrent, but I can stretch it a little bit and come up with these gray area cases in which you and I might be very confused. So if we don't dedicate ourselves to mishpat as a chok, as you say, if we don't define the law very carefully, even if at some point it doesn't necessarily make sense to us. For example, if the halacha takes a very strict approach in opposition to abortion. Again, there are various cases in which the, yeah. the Torah is lenient. I'm not, I'm not getting into all the nitty gritty no, right. details. Yeah. But whatever you define as life, an ubar, b'mei imo, a fetus in its mother's womb, has a status of a nefesh. Perhaps relative to the mother, in a case where the fetus is endangering the life of the mother, maybe the fetus is less of a nefesh. 
whatever that might mean. On the other hand, to save a fetus will violate Shabbat, which means that the fetus is a living creature. So where do you place it? And therefore we thrust ourselves into the occupation, the project of defining halacha, defining what life is, what is murder, what does lo tirzach entail, and then once we define that, we have to give it our all. We have to have the same level of commitment as we would for paraduma, if that's your paradigm of a chok. So, the Torah insists, that's, that's his final conclusion, again, this is part of a very long lecture, but I just wanted to give you the gist of it, that a mishpat has to be accepted just as a chok has to be accepted. Our commitment must be unshakable, universally applicable and upheld, even when our mind, our moral sense, our logos, is confused. Otherwise, every social and moral law can be rationalized away. So we don't view ethics, you know, the word ethics, which is a Greek word, ethos, which means mores or societal uh, customs, we don't view it that way. There's a Jewish ethical law, and it has to be accepted, even if we like it, we don't like it, we find it logical, we don't, as if it were a chok. So what we're beginning to do now is blur the distinction between a chok and a mishpat. Because again, even if initially the mishpat sounds very warm to us, you know, we can, we can feel the closeness to a mishpat, we identify with it, it makes logical sense to our minds. Nevertheless, at some point, we have to jump into the mishpat, accept it with the same commitment, without any rationalizations and any logical basis, but simply because of the Torah law. Now take for example, I'd love to show you this Gemara if we have time, on page 2, a Gemara in Brachot. You'll see it's number Bet on the page. And the Gemara tells us about Chizkiyo, who was the great Tzaddik, the great king of Israel, and he was so ill that he was on his deathbed. And Yeshayahu comes to visit him and quotes a very famous passage, Tzav lebeitcha, in other words, give your last will and testament to your family, ki meitata velo tichyeh. You're going to die and you won't live. And the Gemara asks the question, what does it mean, you'll die and you won't live? Why the double language? Meitata ba'olam hazeh, you're going to die in this world, velo tichyeh la'olam haba. Hamar Leich, his kill, turns to the Navi and he says, Michael, what was my terrible sin for which I'm going to die and get cut off even for the next world? Because this Yom HaMelech did not get married, did not have children at that point. So this Yom comes to defend himself. He says, you know why I didn't fulfill this mitzvah? Mishum dechazoyli beruach hakodesh de nafka minoy bonin de lo male. I saw that down the line I would have children who would not be tzaddikim. That's the understatement. They wouldn't be great Jews. Amar lei. So the Navi turns back to Chizki and he says a very famous sentence. Bahadi kavshi derachman olamalach. Rashi says, Storim shal hakodesh baruchu Lamalach, why are you getting involved in the secrets of the divine? So you had Ruach HaKodesh. Says Yishayahu Anavi, that's none of your business. That's up to the divine being. That which you're commanded to do, Rashi says, Masha Tamitzuva Lasos, Chayavato Lasos. Umad Nicha Kabe HaKodesh Baruch Hu, Liavid. Let HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God in Heaven, will make the calculations what's going to come out of your actions. You are fulfilling the mitzvah. In other words, don't come with logical calculations. On the one hand, Chizkyo makes sense. Why would I want to father someone who's going to be destructive to this world? But on the other hand, says the Navi, that's not your attitude to, towards a mitzvah. Don't rationalize your lack of commitment to a mitzvah. The Torah command requires that you get married and have children. That's what you got to do. Don't make calculations. Don't make rationalizations. And this, by the way, touches on the whole issue of what we call Tame HaMitzvot. Meaning, do we look at a mitzvah and say, oh, I understand the mitzvah. For example, the famous case of Khan Sipar, of Shiluach HaKan, right? You want to take the fledglings, the little birds, and you have to send away the mother birds first. The mother bird first. So surprisingly enough, the Mishnah says in Brachos Daflam and Gimel, which is number Gimel on your page, 
Ha'omer, one who declares in front of God when he prays, Al Kansipar Yagira Hamecha, God in heaven, you have such compassion on a bird. How much more so should you have compassion on a human being? And whenever you do good, God, then it, 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 it builds up your name. So therefore you should bestow goodness upon us. And the Mishnah says in such a case, Mishashkin also. We silence him. Don't come in front of God with explanations and rationalizations for his mitzvot. You may think that Kansipa makes absolute sense. But perhaps at some point, you'll have to throw up your hands and um, admit that I can't really figure it out. It's not necessarily rational. When you get into the nitty gritty of, of the halachot and all their nuances, it may or may not make sense to you. And I have many sources here that discuss this question about whether mitzvot can, can be rational. So why, I mean, doing when Yom Kippur, when we are praying, we are, we are doing a lot of these things. We are giving an example of, of, of Hashem's mercy in, in certain situations. We're asking to have mercy on us as well. But don't explain the mitzvot as mercy. Meaning, because it's very dangerous. As soon as you say this mitzvah is built on mercy, on divine compassion, you never know what that rationalization, what conclusions it might lead to. So again, when you come in front of Almighty God and, and, you, and you petition for His divine passion, that's what prayer is all about. But to take a mitzvah in the Torah and say, well, I understand you, God. I know what you have in mind. You never know where that will lead you down the line because you'll start uh, getting very confused about some of the details of the mitzvah. I'm uh, just having a bit of a difficulty with this concept in general. Maybe I'm going a little bit on a tangent. Uh, in our day of the, uh, the day and age, of, we, we, we always have to find a cause, right? Um, and uh, why would God give us those laws when He doesn't give us a reason? Like, how do I explain to somebody who's secular why you can't tear the toilet paper on Shabbat? Right. But, like, it just doesn't make sense that it drives people away, you know, when you start telling them, well, that's because God told, told us to do that. Right. You know, you're, you're raising the issue of what, what I call kiruv. You're familiar with that word, kiruv. You know, to reach out to the Jewish people. But here in Eishat Torah, I mean, that's a, that should be a very uh, high-profile word, right? There are two approaches to kiruv. One approach says what we have to do is show the beauty of the Torah, how wonderful it is, come closer and you'll enjoy it. And the other approach says, no, we... We're not here to sell the Torah and convince anyone of its ultimate beauty and logic. We have, to, we have to bring people into the study of the Torah. Certain parts of the Torah will be very difficult. And they're not a bowl of cherries. You know, the central motif or symbol of the Torah is also the Mizbeach. After all, there is a mitzvah of Kiddush Hashem, which requires a person, if need be, to give up his life for the sake of the Torah. So the Torah is not just simply, you know, cherries and a lot of fun. There are a lot of things about the Torah that are very demanding. I always give the example, it's a, it's a very difficult halakha, and I hope no one here should ever experience this. But imagine if, let's say on the day before Sukkot, one of your close relatives passes on, and you bury the relative right before the Chag. Where's Shiva? Where's Avelus? completely gone. I had a student of mine. We buried his father 45 minutes before Shkir in Beit Shemesh, in Eretz Chaim, in that cemetery. We had 45 minutes to get back to Yerushalayim before Chag Sukkot. And my student had no shiva whatsoever. On the contrary, what mitzvah was he obligated in? V'samachta b'chagecha. Who could, who could imagine such a thing? What superhuman being could bury his father? He was a young man from Los Angeles. I still remember to this day. I knew him very well. And now come back to his, his apartment in, in Yerushalayim. No shiva. On the contrary, So how do we, quote unquote, sell Yiddishkeit? Should our approach be, well, everything's beautiful, everything's wonderful, it's great, you know, Shabbos is wonderful, and Yontif is wonderful, and yeah, we've got to give that too, for sure. We want to show our, uh, uh, put our best foot forward, that's for sure. But at the same time, I think, the other approach is correct too. 
There are many things about Judaism that we don't understand. What would be the paradigm, in my, in my opinion, and I think you'll agree with me, the, the, the archetype of a parasha in the Torah, which is so difficult to, to rationalize. And it goes back to our, you know, the founder of, of our religion, of our people, the first father of us. What do I have in mind? The Akedah, for sure. Now, now, now go out and do Kiruv with the Akedah as your banner. <laughs> I'd like to see you succeed, you know? <laughs> that Almighty God comes to Avram Avinu and he says, <laughs> I mean, in every word, adds to the, to the difficult agony that Avram must have experienced about who this child is, how he waited a century for this child, the entire future of, of, of all the beliefs and all the promises, the divine promises. And who is Avram Avinu if not the pillar of Chesed? And he's going to take his only son and slaughter him, slaughter him. It's by the way, Akedat Yitzchak is an unbelievably popular theme for art, for, for, you know, for painters throughout, Jew, throughout history, not, not Jewish art. I'm talking about non-Jewish art. Maybe you've seen them. If you go to the Tel Aviv Museum, there's a, a, a full wall picture by a Dutch painter, Levens, of Akedat Yitzchak. It's an unbelievable masterpiece. But, you, I mean, you see the agony. I mean, he's picking up the makolet. You know, you know, at the end of the day, God prevented him from, from going through with it at the very last second. But yet there is this concept of a chok. The Torah is not just all, you know, happy, fun, and dancing, and stuff which we love, but there are also difficult parts. The Torah is very demanding. And I'm, I, I don't think we should falsify that when we try to explain the Torah, but on the other hand, we have to explain that if we don't have an approach of chok, if we're not willing at some point to surrender our minds, even our very rationality, which is the Seichel Adam that defines man and what makes man unique, if we're not willing to do that, then we cannot possibly commit ourselves to a legal system of Torah and Mitzvot, which is universal, which is absolute, which will apply in any generation to any people. Now, by the way, you mentioned about cutting toilet paper. The, the, there are ways of doing it. You know, but again, you've got to really know the halacha very carefully to understand how to cut toilet paper if you don't have. And pardon the expression, but the Torah goes down into the nitty gritties. Okay. So you mentioned it, and I'm going to relate to it. You know, the question is how you would do it and how you would pull it off. It. But it's a serious legal system. And again, what is it with the moral systems of man? And I'm not going to talk to you now about Christianity, which has its issues, but all of these issues that we've had. And today in Western society, they justify, they rationalize almost anything. So today homosexuality is in style and, and various forms of corruption and cheating the government, and you can justify almost everything. Abortion and euthanasia, mercy killing, put a person out of his misery, it goes on and on, the list is almost endless. Because I said before, the Greeks who invented the word ethics had in mind a kind of societal uh, structure in which every time and every place should reflect what is considered acceptable and what's not. And the Torah comes along with an absolute system. It has to be interpreted. It has to be understood. We can only un appreciate it if we see the entire picture. That's why Chazal emphasized over and over again, Ein Amar Chasid. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to take someone who's ignorant and knows a little bit here and a little bit there. You know, sometimes if you know a little bit, it's worse than if you know nothing. Until you see the whole picture. You know the story, there's a famous story I'll tell you, I'm sure you've all heard it, about two yeshiva students. They were buddies. And they, uh, they used to talk a lot about philosophical issues and understanding Judaism. And they both had their challenges, you know. It wasn't easy. They had questions to ask and they were unanswered. So they decided to make an agreement. They made a partnership deal. They said, you know what, you go to university and find the answers. I'm going to, I'm going to go to this yeshiva and I'm going to find my answers. They met 10 years later and each one turned to the other and said, how did it go? So the yeshiva guy turns to the university student and he said, well, did you find the answers to your questions? And he said, no, I have even more questions than I had before. Then he turns to the yeshiva guy who's been learning Torah for 10 years and he says, well, did you find the answers to your question? He says, I don't have any questions. <laughs> you know, that's what it means to learn Torah. It doesn't, 
By the way, philosophically, it doesn't mean that you can answer the questions. On the contrary, as the Rav says, you, you're suspending your rationality. You don't necessarily have the answers. But you get so familiar and so well-versed and so overwhelmed with the enormity of the Torah, with its complexity, with its divine nature, this is what brings you to faith. Now, everybody's different, and obviously everyone achieves faith in their own personal way. I know my sister, for example, her chizuk, her strength in emunah and faith comes from Jewish history. She reads Jewish history, and this is what brings her to God. Her husband, my brother-in-law, who's a scientist, says that he sees God when he looks at cells in electroscanning microscopes that magnify them 100,000 times the size. And I say, I see God when I learn a good sugi, if I can come up with a good chiddush, then I see God. Everybody has their own personal way of coming to God, but one thing is clear, if you're not really dedicated and steeped in learning, the questions will constantly gnaw on your mind. You've got to see the whole picture. Okay, wh how are we doing on the clock here? Because I, uh, no. I, I promised you that we would... Ten minutes? Okay, I, I'll hold your question for ten minutes because I promised you that I want to see if we could find a link, a connection, between last week's parasha, the parasha of Chukas HaTorah Paraduma, and this week's special reading of Zos Chukas HaPesach of Karman Pesach. What's the connection between the two other than the fact that the Torah calls them both a chuk? So we found a medrash, which on page one is the third source on your page. And lo and behold, the medrash actually compares the two and tries to decide which one is superior. It quotes a pasuk in Tehillim, David Amel says, Yehili bi tamim bechukecha, may my heart be complete, meaning without question, even in its dedication to the chok. And goes on to say, that what's chukecha in plural? What does David HaMelech mean when he used the plural referring to these ordinances, these statutes? Ze chukat ha-pesach ve chukat para aduma. This medrash was tailor-made for us. <laughs> As if they knew that we were going to ask this question. How to combine and connect the two readings that we had last Shabbat and yesterday, the Shabbat of Pesach. Sheshneim domim zelaze, they're very similar one to the other. In fact, bazenem arzot chukat haPesach, who bazenem arzot chukat haTorah. The the language is too similar to be coincidental. The iatayodea ezo chukag dola mizu. Which one is more fundamental? Which is greater than the other? And to answer this question, he says the following: Mashal l'shtei matronot domot shayu mahalchot shtei kachat. Near Ot Shavot, these two fancy ladies that are walking down the street, they look very similar. They're walking together. Migdolamizu, <coughs> who's greater? who's greater? Hapara. Pesach Interesting. If I want to eat from the Korban Pesach, and I'm in a state of Tum'ah, let's say I, I, I buried the dead, whatever it might be, I have a problem. Because in a state of defilement, of contamination, you can't bring the Korban Pesach, you can't eat from the Korban Pesach. So my only way out in this case, having been defiled to the dead, is what? is the paraduma. The paraduma generated the mechatat for the purification of a tome. Says the Medrash. Let's think about it. On the one hand, the paraduma is the precondition without which I won't be able to get to my goal of bringing the Karban Pesach. But on the other hand, what's my ultimate goal? Karban Pesach. So which is greater? Do we put the emphasis and the preference on the precondition that which is necessary to achieve the goal, or what's greater is the goal? What would you have said? Which is greater, Paraduma or Chukata Pesach? Chef, can you help me out here? Say the goal. The goal, correct. Isn't that the intuitive response that one would give? The Paraduma is the means to the end, but the end is to bring the carbon Pesach. And the major says just the opposite. 
the paraduma is even greater than the Korban Pesach. And I would like to spend the next few minutes that we have trying to understand this Medrash. And I'm basing myself largely on things that I heard over the course of time from my Rebbe. I don't want anyone to think that I'm plagiarizing him. But he thought that Paraduma and Pesach symbolize two different concepts of Chok. Both are very fundamental to our Yiddishkeit, our belief in Judaism. Paraduma represents the Chok of a Jew's commitment to his own personal observance of the Torah. We mentioned before how many difficult stumbling blocks there may be on the road to fulfill Hashem's mitzvot. We don't just wake up, jump out of bed and fulfill all the mitzvot. It's tough, especially in rough weather, right? So there are challenges along the way. What does Paraduma symbolize? Personal purification. It's between me and Almighty God but it requires my total commitment to both the chukim and the mishpatim, because even the mishpatim, as we discussed before, are ve'ela, are like the, are like the chukim, it requires an absolute commitment. Pesach, on the other hand, represents a different sort of chuk. The carbon Pesach is a communal carbon we get together in groups. All of Klal Yisrael shares this obligation. The Chok of Pesach symbolizes a national historical commitment. I am a Jew. I am part of a people. And all oh, that history is so, so difficult to comprehend. We started, we mentioned the Akeda. We could go on and say, Lech Lecha, Me'artzacha, Me'maladetcha. We have the case of Yaakov Avinu, who's told to go down to Mitzrayim. 210 years of slavery and oppression. And then we have the four Galiot, Yavan and Bavel and, and Edom. We have all the kingships, the sovereign rulers that subjugate the Jewish people throughout its history. Even the golden age of Spain, in which the Jews were at the head of commerce and industry, government, and yet it ended with exile, with Girush. Jewish history is like a zigzag. It makes no sense. We move forward, we take a step forward, and we think we're coming closer to the ultimate independence of the Jewish people, and then we take two steps backwards. Baruch Hashem, today we have the state of Israel, so we've made some great strides. But nevertheless, look at the situation. 80 million Arabs that surround us, Iran that threatens us for possibly nuclear war, has to show them. The situation of the Jew requires, on the part of each and every one of us, a commitment to the national destiny of the Jewish people. That's Chukat HaPesach. So we have a double Chok over here. We have the Chok of the Paraduma. That represents a personal commitment and dedication to purity, to ascend the ladder, Mi Lebahar Hashem, a commitment to all the mitzvot, no matter what challenges Hashem may put in front of us. And then on the other hand, the commitment that's symbolized by Chupkat Pesach to the nation, to the people, to Jewish history, to accept that as much as this confuses us, it's an absolute chok. Why? Why can't Hashem just end all Jewish suffering? And we have no answers, but yet, we are dedicated to that task. And the Medrash raises the phenomenal question, which is greater? Which takes precedence? And the answer is Paradu. As important as it is to be elevated by our connection to the nation, to the people, to the entire community, what's first and foremost, what's absolutely critical, we can't get off the ground without it, is the Paradu Machok. If a person is not dedicated to his mitzvot, to 613 precepts on a regular basis to fulfill those, then he's lacking the basic ingredient of tar of purification. On these days, as we come close to Chag HaPesach, I believe that we have to prepare ourselves with these two messages, both of Chok. On the one hand, the Chok of the Paraduma on a personal level, and on the other hand, 
the Chok of Korban Pesach on the national. All our experiences during Pesach, at the night of the Seder, integrate both levels and both dimensions. Now, personal commitment to the mitzvot, to the matzah, and to the morar, and to the shulchan aruch, and all the mitzvot of the Lila, and at the same time, to stand in front of the Yibon Shalom and say to him, Kein yagienu Hashem alokeinu, lirgolim acherim, v'nochal shom min azvachim u'min apsachim. What we can hope for and pray for is that every single Jew awaken himself or herself during this period of time to a greater commitment, to a love for Torah and mitzvot, and moreover, to the commitment to the nation, to that destiny that somehow defies our understanding, and that our Kosh Baruch will shine in us His mercy and His compassion and bring about the day in which we can all, in Eretz Yisrael, experience the Beit HaMikdash rebuilt and eat from the Karbun Pesach. Can you at some point? Amen. Amen. Shreb. I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for, for joining me this morning. We should have a wonderful Chag. And we should be Zolcha to the Gula Shleim.